Hi, everyone. We're going to get started in just a moment. We have a full uh, session of information today, so we are going to mute the room right here at the beginning. And it is exactly 1.30, so I'm going to mute myself and spotlight um, our daytime risk co-chair, Lynn Lasher, for introduction. We will move on to Fred for our presentation, and I hope you all enjoy learning about the Midway today. Take it away, Lynn. Good afternoon. Fred Shatsky has been a docent with the USS Midway Museum since it opened to the public in 2004. Fred is a former Navy Lieutenant and will be presenting a slideshow presentation for us today. Please join me in welcoming Fred Shatsky. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I'm spotlighted here. Do I? Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Lynn, for the invitation and the nice introduction. And to everybody in the Zoom room, I hope you're comfortable in your little spaces. I see a big crowd out there. And some of you might be curious about my virtual background here. So I, I'm going to explain that normally I'm, uh, I don't like virtual backgrounds, but uh, this one, it really sends a message. And I think that the uh, fact is that uh, sometimes I'm in a Zoom room with no introduction. So uh, this shows that uh, I can't be a man who needs no introduction. And uh, that cliche was intended. So let me get situated here. I'm sh am I sharing my screen now? Does everybody see that? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, well, I've been talking for nothing. I'm gonna share the screen. <laughs> well, we see you. Oh, you see me, okay. Yes, well, but we're, we're waiting for your presentation. Okay, let me close this. All right, well, the background you see is the flight deck of the Midway. And uh, I'm gonna reveal somebody who does need an introduction and I intend to introduce him later. You'll see this guy later in my program. In this program, I'm gonna discuss how the Midway evolved I'm going to share the screen. For 47 years as the longest serving aircraft carrier in history and in the 20th century. And uh, the way it evolved from aircraft carrier to museum, I'm also going to exemplify because some people still feel that the museum is a symbol of war. I would like to show it more as a symbol of peace and freedom. I intend to describe some of the carrier operations and focus on a few of the museum aircraft that I find most interesting. Now in this program, the time limitation is such that I probably won't be able to cover all of these objectives. And I might not answer all of your questions. I do have a compilation of frequently asked questions on the run through. So I hope if I don't cover your interests that you will email me. My email address is simply fshatsky at midway.org. And here is the Midway as it looked in its final evolution. Four acre flight deck, a thousand foot length, equivalent to a football length of a football field three times, with a displacement of very roughly 70,000 tons loaded. I say very roughly because uh, there's no real standards of what constitutes an aircraft carrier's load. The capacity of water and fuel alone can amount to about 15,000 tons. So depending on the information source, you can see different numbers for ships displacement. Now you also see, you might be curious to know what these two horns protruding off of the flight deck are. They are actually not in use anymore. There's only one other aircraft carrier that has these horns. All aircraft carriers from the 1950s, all aircraft carriers with catapults, from the early 1950s to the 90s, all had these horns, and then they were removed, were removed because they became dead weight, and no other aircraft carriers had them. Now, the reason for their existence was that they were launching older style aircraft that attached to the shuttle of the catapult in a different manner. And that's about all I can explain with the time limit that I have. Now, Midway didn't always look like this. This was its final stage of evolution, it looked like this in its maturity, but in its infancy and adolescence, this is what it looked like. Much smaller aircraft carrier, 
straight deck axial aircraft carriers is called, uh, and about 10,000 tons lighter. It's first in many ways, it was first in its class, and by class it means aircraft carriers that were being built at that time. There are three of them designated to be built at the start of World War II. Midway was first in this class, so the three are called Midway class carriers. It was the first aircraft carrier with an armored steel flight deck, three and a half inches of armored steel, two inches of armored steel down on the hangar deck and one deck below. And the reason being is that they learned lessons from the previous class of aircraft carriers, the Essex class with wooden flight decks, they found that they were very vulnerable to bombs. It was the first aircraft carrier too large to go through the Panama Canal. And in that respect, they were thinking even then of widening the Panama Canal. It took 70 years until they finally did. And the irony is that ships larger than aircraft carriers, cruise ships as they are now larger, can pass through, but aircraft carriers still can't because of the configuration of the angle deck. Has four engine rooms, 12 boiler rooms, creating 200,000 horsepower, which is pretty powerful. And these engine rooms and boiler rooms still exist on its final stage as it is now. It costs only $85 million to construct. And that was a bargain, even in money and value of those days. And only 18 months to construct. And there's an explanation that some people consider it was because women were working on it. No, no, the iconic poster gal, Rosie the Riveter, with the Women's Ordnance Workers League. And it was because men were fighting the war and women were working on ships. Now, when Rosie the Riveter got all of the glory, but on the Midway, she didn't really do much because there was minimal riveting. It was a lot of welding and Wendy the welder did the work. She's so not, not very well known. Rosie the Riveter got all the glory. Now, from the time it started operating, there were many deficiencies noted. And uh, they didn't really work in correcting them until months later, they sent her on a cruise to the Caribbean. And uh, then she went on a cruise to the Arctic region. They sent her to test her vulnerability to rigid frost and frigid conditions. And then they learned that they would need to weatherproof the ship. They took care of the, uh, the uh, bridge. They enclosed it and they enclosed that bow as you see that's open here. And about 10 years later, after many cruises, I won't go into all of the operations, she went on a global voyage, 22,000 miles, to go from the Atlantic fleet that she served for 10 years to the Pacific fleet and uh, did some operations there. And in 1956, she went into the Naval Shipyard in Puget Sound, Washington, for a major overhaul that took twice as long as it did to construct. It took three years. And uh, she came out looking like this. She went from her infancy to adolescence. She was prepubescent. She grew horns. And some of the major changes they made Biggest one was this angled deck. Now, Midway was one of the first aircraft carriers with an angled deck. And uh, it wasn't uh, really an original idea from our Navy. It came from Great Britain. And the reason for the angled deck was because jets were beginning to fly. And whereas the initial stage of the aircraft carrier had more cables to catch the aircraft, they needed a clear runway because jets were coming in faster. They also did some major changes, moving the elevators, starting to move the elevators to the deck edge. And they also removed many of the guns, as you can see in this illustration here, many guns. And people, when they come aboard the museum now, they ask, where are the guns? And it's not because guns were removed from the museum. They were removed because aircraft carriers evolved to the point where guns, anti-aircraft guns became unnecessary. Close range protection was well done with the aircraft uh, and the air and the ships in its company, and uh, there was more need for long-range missile launchers.
Now that served the purpose for about 10 years and then it went to Hunter's Point in San Francisco for another major overhaul, which quadrupled the cost. And it came out looking as it did in its final stage. It went from two acres to four acres. And the value in that change when it went from this configuration to this configuration, as you can see, there were 14 arresting cables. As you know, an aircraft carrier comes into land, tail hook catches one of these cables, and it will stop hopefully before a tragedy might occur. In this case, because the aircraft were coming in slow, propeller driven aircraft, they can easily catch one of these cables. And if they didn't, there were barricades up here to stop them. And the situation is because aircraft that are not flying are all parked on the bow. People are under the misconception that an aircraft will fly, land on the flight deck, go down by the elevator, and then come back up again when it's ready to fly. That's not the case. All of the aircraft during flight operations are on the flight deck. And the aircraft has to stop before it crashes into them. Now you can see some of the changes here too. The catapult, which I'll talk about catapults later, here is a much shorter and not as powerful catapult as when they configured it to steam powered catapults and they reduced the number of cables to three plus a barricade because the jets were coming in. They needed a clear, so to speak, one way because if a cable is not caught, which is called a bolter, and that aircraft can get back into a sequence, can get airborne and get back into a sequence and try again. As you can see, they moved these elevators to the deck edge, which made sense because in this situation, they make great targets for bombs. And they did enlarge the island structure and they had weather for it. Midway had many home ports including San Diego. But the most noteworthy one is when it was home ported in Yokosuka, Japan, Tokyo Bay. It was there for almost 18 years. It was the first aircraft carrier ever home ported in a foreign country. And the situation, Japan having been such an enemy years before, the situation was improved even before the Midway, but even more so on the Midway. There were Japanese working on the Midway, and it was a great relationship. Situation changed when the Midway left, and years later, the USS George Washington went to be home ported in Tokyo Bay. It was met by activists protesting its arrival, but concerned that there might be potential radiation leakage in Tokyo Bay. The irony is that years later, when they had that tsunami that created the Fukushima energy plant tragedy, it was the USS Ronald Reagan that went to help them. And uh, it's now, Ronald Reagan is now home ported in Yokosuka, Japan. It's been there now for about three or four years. In its 47 year existence, Midway was in combat situations. 10% of its existence, which doesn't sound like a lot, but over 47 years, it is quite a bit. Now I mentioned that uh, there are some people who are resistant to the museum because they consider it a symbol of war. And this is one example that I like to point out that really shows Midway as a symbol of peace and freedom. Midway did not uh, play a role in the in World War II because it was not yet commissioned. It didn't uh, participate in the Korean War because it was in the Mediterranean uh, as a deterrent to Soviet uh, uh, force in the Cold War. But it was very active in Vietnam through three deployments. And in the last deployment, Operation Frequently, was such a great example of its uh, humanitarian uh, existence. And I like to point out this exhibit because so many people walk by oblivious to it. This is in the hangar bay, a little Cessna type bird dog observation plane hanging from the overhead. It was flown by a South Vietnamese Air Force major. And in this plane, which was a two-seater, he had his wife and five children. 
And during the evacuation of Vietnam, where Midway was instrumental in evacuating 5,000 refugees, it was very chaotic. Marine helicopters were bringing them aboard. And this little bird dog was flying over and had left Saigon because had this pilot stayed with his family, they would have been murdered. So they escaped in this aircraft. They flew over the Midway and dropped a note on the flight deck asking if they could land, if he can land his plane on the flight deck. To do so, little helicopters like these, a million dollars worth had to be thrown overboard. Why did the Midway allow them to do that? Normally, if a plane was flying like this, it has to be landing. Even if it was an American plane, they would have said, ditch it in the ocean and would be rescued at sea. The fact that he had a little infant there and his family, millions of dollars of helicopters were thrown overboard and allowed this aircraft to land. And uh, it didn't have a tail hook, so it landed, touched down at the fan tail and almost rolled over the angled deck. And it was met by applause. And it was really a wonderful story. Now, I can't tell that story as good as the air boss who was on that on the Midway at that time. He tells the story real great because he lived it and he is now a docent on the Midway. And when I tell people to look at this exhibit, I direct them to this little video, a five minute narration by the air boss. And uh, if anybody, if, if any one of you go aboard the Midway, I do encourage you to look for that. And if you don't, you can find this video on the internet, just Google, Operation Frequent Wind, U.S. Midway, and you'll get some really good things. This last combat activity was Operation Desert Storm, the first Persian Gulf War. And uh, it really played a very active role in that activity because it was the flagship for Operation Desert Storm. Flagship meaning even though there are other aircraft carriers in the task force, Midway had the flag officer, Admiral Dan March, and, uh, he coordinated all of the battle activities for the other aircraft carriers, other ships and aircraft. No submarines. And that's because there were no submarines there. The uh, area was too shallow to swim in. Now, if you come aboard, you can go to the Tactical Flag Command Center. It's now open to visit. And you can see how that activity was set up. And you'll see the Admiral Flag Officer, Admiral Dan March on a video explaining some of the situation. Now its last operation, also a humanitarian gesture was during Operation Fiery Vigil when it went to the Philippines to rescue Air Force and Naval personnel from Bach Air Force Base and uh, Subic Bay because it was covered with ash. It was very chaotic because they had women, children, and pets aboard overnight and the Midway survived. Midway wasn't the only one in that operation and also was dealing with the USS Abraham Lincoln, a nuclear aircraft carrier, and the uh, amphibious assault ship, the Pelagoo. And then at the end of its existence, 47 years of service, it came to San Diego for the final decommissioning ceremony. And when I say decommissioning, a lot of people ask, when was Midway decommissioned? And I have to say that decommissioning means taken out of service. It can be on a temporary basis, as well as its last decommissioning, which would be retirement. So it was retired in April 92, a ceremony at San Diego. And uh, it then got towed for its resting place in the boneyard, so to speak, the Naval Inactive Ships Maintenance Facility in Bremerton, Washington, where it stayed in mothballs for 12 years, waiting to overcome all of the hurdles before it can become a museum. When I say hurdles, I'm talking financial, environmental, political, and even civil, because as I said, there were some people who resisted Midway coming to San Diego. But it overcame all of those hurdles, and uh, it was towed all the way from Bremerton, Washington, with a stop at Oakland, where it got a little bit of a paint job and then towed to San Diego to put in its berth with the condition that it be a successful museum because the Navy didn't want to turn over a, a ship to become a museum, judging from past experiences. There are four other aircraft carrier museums not doing so well. Even the Intrepid in Manhattan 
which is a close uh, unpopularity to, uh, to uh, the midway, they're not doing well. So they were taking a chance and the founders who set up this uh, foundation to bring Midway here was a group of uh, entrepreneurs who raised money, fundraising. They had to raise a lot of money. And in those days, without Venmo or GoFundMe, they had to really beat the problems. So they raised a lot of money, millions of dollars, and it was almost spent by the time Midway was here. They were down to maybe their last million dollars. And it cost five, half a million dollars to tow it here. If it had to be towed back, they didn't have enough money to send it back, but they would have none of their expense. Fortunately, Midway became a success. I like to point out something about this image here, especially for San Diego. This was 17 years ago when it came in January, 2004. Look at the skyline and look at the skyline today. What a difference in just 17 years. You don't see the extra cruise terminal that was built here. And uh, even if you look at the skyline today, it's gonna be meager compared to the skyline in a few years because of constant construction in that downtown harbor area and Midway is the center of the focal point. So it came to rest in its birth and opened six months later, June, 2004, to an unexpected crowd. It was so crowded uh, and it continued to be so crowded and the museum was not prepared for it. I wasn't a volunteer yet and there were probably uh, one eighth of the number of volunteers aboard, but they survived. And I also like to point out to San Diego, so if you look at this location here, it's barren compared to what it is today. Now, San Diegans will recognize this as the fish market. Now, amongst all of the resistance to the Midway being here, the fish market was one of the resistors. Now, to overcome the resistance of the Port Commission and the Coastal Commission, what the Midway did to appease them, because their argument was that this ship was going to block the view of the harbor and the view of Coronado. And that was a foolish argument. So the founders had overcome that argument by allowing visitors to go up this forward brow and stay forward of this area here. They can even walk out on the horns and uh, look at Coronado and the harbor. That's just to appease the Coastal Commission and the Port Commission. And it did. I mean, they had no argument after that. Now, to appease the fish market, because their concern was that the food service on the Midway was going to interfere with their business. Now, that was also a foolish argument. They learned afterwards that it was the Midway who actually increased their business. And that's because the Midway, with great fundraising, started to add to that area the Kiss statue. I'm sure you're all familiar with the unconditional surrender. This Kiss statue. Satcher was brought here mainly because of the Midway's fundraising. They raised over a million dollars by selling blocks here with donations, uh, the contributors' names on there. Mine is right around here, I think. If you step on the Shatsky family, you'll know that's me. And also later came Bob Hope and his contingency with statues that also brightened the area. And this area became a show place now known as Tuna Harbor Park. And it brings in a lot of people at the fish market was so pleased with that that they became a major supporter of it and contributed a lot of money to illuminate it so that their evening divers have a beautiful view of the midway. I'll just spend a couple minutes boasting about its achievements. Before COVID, the average attendance was one and a quarter million per year. Uh, TripAdvisor named it the most visited of all historic naval ship museums in the world. Technology has increased the audio tour up to six languages. People are surprised to know that it's not Spanish, which you would think in terms of our proximity to the border, that's the second spoken language. It's Mandarin because of the big Chinese uh, influence. More than 800 volunteers are aboard and uh, that outnumbers the paid staff by two to one. Most of the volunteers are docents, so I'm proud to say. And uh, Midway has such great revenue streams. It hosts approximately 700, well, it did before COVID, 700 private events annually. Uh, 
weddings, bar mitzvahs, graduations, corporate events, with unlimited spending in the revenue stream of the midway, very successful financially, operating in the black for three years. Now, I didn't know there was a national poll of meeting planners, but they named Midway the top event, and it takes more than a year to get on a waiting list to hold an event for the Midway. TripAdvisor ranked Midway number one of all, all attractions in San Diego, including the zoo. Right? So, uh, even though the zoo attendance is tenfold, of any type of museum in the United States, and there are 35,000 museums, TripAdvisor rated Midway number five. And of any type in the world, number 22. So how does TripAdvisor come up with such ratings? Do they visit all of these attractions? No, they go by reviews. And they've got excellent reviews for the Midway. So I tell people, if you're having a good experience on the Midway, write a review. You're having a bad experience, write a review, but not for TripAdvisor, write it for Yelp. And even Yelp gets great reviews in the movie. Midway is more than a museum, it has a first class education department uh, offering short courses to uh, STEM courses to kindergartners through eighth grade, overnight programs that include parents and scoutmasters. And there's kind of there is a mission for the Midway, and it's accomplished that to host 50,000 students a year. With the mission that every student in San Diego will board the Midway at least once. And they have a uh, No Child Left the Shore program where families that can't afford to pay, they will be allowed to come aboard the Midway. Now, at this point, I compiled many questions. I, uh, get questions, I ask questions, and uh, I'm gonna go through these questions because they might cover some of the questions you have in mind. And with the time limit, I might not be able to do that. So I do encourage you, if you'd like, please email me at easy email address, fshatsky at midway.org, and I will be glad to accommodate. Get many personal questions, uh, and I'm asked if I served on the Midway. I say I'm serving now, what would you like? I spent and spending now uh, 17 years since the museum opened. And that's five times longer than I served on active duty in the Navy, which included four months of officer candidate school, a year on an aircraft carrier, and two years in Puerto Rico. So when I'm asked if I served in the Navy, I say the Navy served me because I had a great experience in the Navy. I had a very easy job in the communications department, and that's because I wasn't Navy career. I already had a career, and I have to confess that I became a naval officer because I didn't want to get drafted into the Army. So that's my guilt feeling, and a somewhat payback for now that I'm serving on the Midway. I feel I'm contributing more than I did in the Navy, which is one of the reasons I volunteer on the Midway, right? and there are other reasons as well. I volunteer for nostalgia. I miss the Navy. Volunteer because I miss my youth. I get rejuvenated on the midway. And I also volunteer because of respect. I respect the midway and the respect that I get from the visitors. I never could have imagined that I would be in so many family photo albums around the world. And I used to be proud when they would take my photo. And then I realized that when they visit the zoo, they're taking photos too of other animals. Ego shatter. There are other opportunities to volunteer. I volunteer mostly as a docent, but I also volunteer with the outreach program as I am now doing as part of the Speakers Bureau. And there's a safety department where people can volunteer, and that is a, a lot of volunteers in the safety department. I also have volunteered with the administration department in education, writing and editing articles and policies. But the one area that I really take pride in is being a member of the Not Time team. There's a bunch of, uh, there are about 40 members, volunteers who are members of this team with a handful of docents of Diane. And what we do is we craft items bracelets of all different designs and colors of parachute cord, 
lanyards, keychains, dog leashes, anything. We put them out on tables for display on weekends and holidays to help the visitors buy them with donations. All proceeds go to the Education Department Scholarship Fund. And uh, it brings in about $100,000 a year. And as a result, I'm a mentor now to three scholarship recipients. And uh, I give them grandfatherly advice, like I give my own granddaughter to college students. So I feel rewarded by that. Another question comes up, how many aircraft carriers currently active in the Navy? There are 10 in the Nimitz class that are active now, all nuclear aircraft carriers, and four soon to be active in the Gerald Ford class. Oh, my phone, I gotta stop with you. Well, I thought I stopped it, but it's activated, reactivated. Sorry about that. I hope you all shut off your phones. I always tell people when I'm giving a live lecture, please silence your phones, and then my phone goes off. So all of these Nimitz class are active. When I say class of a carrier, I don't know if I mentioned it before. We're talking about ships that are being built by money appropriated to be built them. Now, as you can see, 30 some odd years apart, they're not all identical, but they were designated to be built with the same general hull design. So this and George H.W. Bush ended in the Nimitz class. We have a sequence of aircraft carriers, as you can see, numbered in sequence. The N stands for nuclear. The CV, you might think that the C stood for carrier, as I did when before the internet, but there's another explanation for CV. I won't get into it because if you're interested, you can search the internet. CVN nuclear, and it continues with the number 78, 79 through 81. Gerald Ford is now commissioned after six years construction, and it's still not active because they're working at the problems mainly with the electromagnetic launching system, which is an innovation long overdue. So that's changed, that's gonna change what it's all about in launching aircraft. John F. Kennedy is floating, but still not commissioned. Enterprise is under construction. The one that remains to be constructed, the USS Doris Miller. Now you can probably recognize all of these names except Doris Miller, which brings up the question, how do ships and aircraft carriers get named. Uh, originally, the Secretary of the Navy had unlimited authority to name ships, and then it became the Chief of Naval Operations, but there were no rules as to how to name ships. They were all trends. The battleships were named after states. The aircraft carriers earlier were named after the battles, uh, and uh, most of them were Revolutionary War battles. The aircraft carrier that I served on, the USS Saratoga, was a Revolutionary War battle. But then the trend came to name them on, as mostly presidents and other important people. Now, how important should a person be before they get an aircraft carrier named after them? That's very questionable. And there's a couple names here, and I will not get political, that might be removed. Uh, if you want to know the reason why, you can find out on the internet if you don't know already. So look at these names and you try to guess which ones might be removed. But I bring you back to the Doris Miller because I think that's a name that really deserves to be put on aircraft carriers. Now, I would suspect that most of you, if all of you, do not know that name, Doris Miller. And Doris was not a female. It was a male. That's all I'm going to tell you about. So if you want to learn about Doris Miller and why I think, and everybody thinks that he deserves to be named on an aircraft carrier, Google Doris Miller. You're going to get some very interesting links. Questions about fuel and fuel economy that I get, and I also asked, I once asked a group of grade school uh, students uh, that I was entertaining, what kind of fuel did Midway use? A little girl raised her hand and she said, premium. Ask a foolish question and you get a foolish answer. All of these other questions will be answered in the next slide. 
This is the main deck just outside the hangar bay. It's a narrow deck and it extends along the starboard side, the right side. And there are stations here to receive fuel. There are four more forward, pairs of four, pairs of two forward. And this is where a tanker will come alongside during underway replenishment and pump fuel, aviation fuel is purple, ship's fuel yellow. And uh, they were pumping fuel back when Midway was first built in its early uh, configuration. It was right after ships were burning coal. And the fuel that Midway was burning then, NSFO, Naval Special Fuel Oil, was a bunker type fuel. If you're not familiar with bunker fuel, it's a real crude, thick fuel needed to be heated to be pumped, but much more energy rich than the more refined fuels like diesel, which then became the standard fuel for the Midway in the 1970s because it's a cleaner fuel. The aviation fuel is like kerosene, JP5. Receiving fuel at about 12,000 gallons per minute, and you can't fill up your gas tank at that rate, with a total capacity of ship's fuel and aviation fuel amounting to three and a half million gallons. That's a lot of fuel, and it will never go less than half full. So it takes about four and a half hours of replenishment, but while they're replenishing, they're also sending over other commodities, food, other supplies, and uh, it's a four to five hour replenishment, and it's done during normal operations about once or twice a week. This is a little different than what's done on nuclear aircraft carriers because the, the need for fuel replacement, ship's fuel, more so than aviation fuel, is, well, ship's fuel only, is 25 years. You do not have to replace nuclear energy for 25 years. So the life expectancy of a nuclear aircraft carrier at uh, 50 years, it only needs to be refueled once. Now, the Gerald Ford is expected to not need refueling of nuclear energy in its life expectancy of 50 years. Uh, this is an old photo of underway replenishment, where the midway is being replenished by a tanker who is also replenishing a destroyer in its company. Now, if you look closely, you can see hoses attached. And I'm going to zoom in. So that you can see they're also horizontally on a high line transferring something. Uh, this could be some goods or it could be even a bosun's chair, which I can tell you if somebody is sitting in there, that's a pretty exciting ride because I had the privilege when I was on the Saratoga of being sent across to a destroyer in our company uh, who was getting refueled from the Saratoga. And I can tell you that's a pretty exciting ride. And to give you some idea of what it looks like, I put a little video clip in here. That I don't know why it's not coming up. There's a glitch in the system. So, uh, anyhow, I'm sorry I put all of that effort into this video. It worked on my uh, Zoom, but it's not working here. So I don't know what's, what's wrong. Well, what you would see is in a rough sea like this, you would see the chair bouncing up and down by the time it gets to the destroyer. And uh, the reason I was selected, not because I volunteered, was because uh, my collateral duty as a ship's courier, carrier courier, meant that classified material to be brought to other ships would have to be in the company of an authorized officer with a top secret clearance, which I was and to be received by another officer with a top secret clearance, which in this case, they couldn't find the officer on the destroyer. They should have notified that I was coming over. So they spent time looking for that officer, the ships detached. And the reason they couldn't find him was because he was in the head. And I had to wait until he got off the throne. So that was the indignity of my job. And by the time they did, my ship had sailed and I was left for hours uncomfortable on that destroyer at sea. You don't want to be on a small ship like a destroyer. I really appreciated being on an aircraft carrier there. And then they sent a helicopter to pick me up. And this is the way I would normally get transferred with the material from ship to ship. 
with the sling lowered by helicopter. I don't remember ever being poked in the groin with a stick like that, nor do I remember wearing ear protection. Maybe that's the reason why I have hearing aids today. People ask, what do the stencils on the island structure mean? They're not that in, as interested in the letters. These are uh, commander award recognition. You see them uh, posting on the island structure. But they want to know about these, what look like penguins. What are these penguins doing on the structure? Well, they're not penguins. They're images of enemy aircraft that were shot down by squadrons flying over the hill. There are eight of them. One of them was the first and the, the MiG aircraft shot down during Vietnam, and another one was the last. So this is something that is pretty much boasting about the uh, aircraft activity from the Midway. The sad thing is that more aircraft were lost than aircraft that were shot down. We have pilots, we have volunteers, docents on the Midway who were pilots that did get shot down and ended up as POWs sharing cells with John McCain and Admiral Stockdale, and they tell some really good stories, the ones that are still alive, some of them died while they were in What was the size of Midway's crew? Approximately 4,500, one third of which is the air wing. The air wing is not aboard when the ship is in port. And the interesting thing about the Midway, as the Old Navy was, now it's Old Navy, it was all male. The demographics for crew on aircraft now is about 20% female, average age 19 years old on six month deployments. 50 years ago, when I was a young officer aboard, I would never imagine that 50 years later that there would be young women aboard. 19 years of age. Well, I did imagine, I just never would have believed that there would be women aboard. That's the Navy. People want to know who is responsible for the Midway Museum. For one, it's not a city museum, not a state museum, no, no tax dollars are, are supporting the Midway. It's a not for profit private enterprise, very profitable not for profit with a board of directors. It's also a charitable foundation giving charity to other charitable organizations and uh, there's no taxpayer subsidy. Is the Midway Museum loaded? Some people say yes, no, I say maybe. And if you look at the number graduation the hulls of ship, this tells you the draft of the ship. It depends on how much load the ship is carrying. The museum is not carrying a heavy load. There's no fuel or water stored in the bilges. So it's showing that the depth required for midway to float is about 29 feet. Now, at this end, the forward end, facing the deeper part of the harbor, is always that much depth and it's floating. But at a very low tide, at the shallow end of the harbor, midway will touch the bottom very gently on the rudders doesn't damage the hull, and besides, Midway's hull is very well maintained by technology of today underwater, and uh, it only costs the Midway about a million dollars a year to maintain that. As I take groups through a tour through the hangar bay, on each side, this is on the starboard side, in the hangar bay, and on the port side, the left side, there's another one. And I will always ask what's stored in the tank, and the best answer I got was beer. No beer in these tanks, steam. These are steam accumulators and there's one under each catapult. Steam is ducted from the boiler rooms throughout the ship, but there's a big collection here because it takes a lot of steam to launch from the catapult. On the nuclear aircraft carriers where there are four catapults, there's one under each catapult, four of them. But on the Gerald Ford class, there are no longer any steam accumulators because as I said, electromagnetic power is what's used on a catapult. So what is in this barrel? Not a barrel of beer, but if you look up at the perimeter around the rim of the flight deck, you will see about 200 of them. And you can probably guess that they're there for life protection if there is a battle, people are getting overboard or the ship is sinking. The amazing thing about these uh, barrels, by the way, this is the access from the 
main deck where the hangar deck is. They come out the hangar deck and they go up the stairway. This was built for the museum. It was not part of the big way until it became a museum. Now inside the barrel, as you go up the stairs, you will see an example of what the barrel, what's inside the contents of the barrel. And the main part is this inflatable, automatically inflatable life raft that will seat 25 and a lot of provisions. The amazing thing about the technology for this is that it has a hydrostatic clasp that when it splashes in the water, it will open and the uh, life raft will automatically inflate. How fast was the midway? Flank speed, which is faster than top speed, is rated at about 33 knots. And as you might know, a knot is a nautical mile per hour, nautical mile being larger than a land mile, this is about 38 miles per hour. That's pretty fast for a ship that big. You can water ski at that speed. But it would not go at that speed too long because it would burn 10 times the amount of fuel. And on a conventional fuel ship, it's pretty stressful for the ship. Cruising speed, more likely, would be the average speed, 15 knots converted to 17 miles per hour. And if people think that the nuclear aircraft carriers can go faster. No, they don't. They go the same speed, but the difference is that they can sustain flank speed indefinitely, whereas a conventional fuel ship only short term. Was Midway ever attacked? After World War II, no aircraft carrier had ever been attacked, and if there ever is an attack, it will result in World War III, which might be the last World War ever. But Midway was almost destroyed. In 19, mid 1980s, there was a collision with a merchant vessel, a Panamanian uh, cargo ship, the Cactus. Now, why Midway was almost destroyed? It incidentally killed a few of the sailors and it destroyed some of the aircraft. But it hit Midway in such a vulnerable location that if there was a fire that resulted, the whole ship would have blown up because right in there is the liquid oxygen plant. And people want to know why is liquid oxygen manufactured on an aircraft carrier. It's because pilots need it to breathe at high altitude, so they carry tanks of liquid oxygen aboard their aircraft. Now, here's a question that would require a good hour for me to answer. How are aircraft launched and recovered? And I'm gonna give you maybe an answer in five minutes. I'm gonna leave out a lot of details and try to get through it in five minutes. We're on the flight deck here. Without the luxury of a mile or two of runway, an aircraft carrier has to create its own lift. Lift is important for flight, as you know, and during flight operations, the ship would have steered a course into the wind, gather 30 knots of lift across the angle deck. And that could be combined ship speed and wind velocity could be 15 knots per hour of each. But that is important. And air operations begin with the coordination from pride flight, primary flight control. Now, if I was taking you on a guided tour, I would take you up four flights of ladders, as we call them, stairways, and we would look in, in the PLAT compartment, pilot landing a television, which I'm going to talk about soon. And of course, the navigation bridge is important because they're driving the ship. The conning officer will be, be communicating with pride flight air boss, and the air boss will be also communicating with the LSO, which I will be talking about soon. So to launch aircraft, it has to go on, the aircraft have to go on a catapult. I'm not going to get into details how it got here, but assume that it's being directed to go over what it would be lying flat on the flight deck. This is a jet blast deflector. Some people think it adds thrust to the jet. It doesn't, it's there mainly to protect crew on the flight deck and aircraft because this blast is so strong that it can knock people overboard. I do remember one crew, when being knocked overboard when I was on the Saratoga, they survived because uh, they're all wearing life preservers. The color of their jerseys, by the way, denotes their job responsibility. And they're all wearing flotation vests. He survived only because it was in the Caribbean, it was in cold water. He probably wouldn't have survived because it took an hour to rescue him. And uh, it was not the aircraft carrier, but the helicopters or other ships in the company that rescued them. All of what you see here is not smoke, it's steam, because this aircraft is going to be shot with a steam injection into the catapult to go 
from zero to 300 feet or less in less than three seconds after it's a lot of power, more so than the jet can do it by itself. It needs to stay for the catabolic. Now, to press the button on the catabolic, on the midway, all it took was a sailor. Here's the sailor who will be doing it. He's the deck edge operator. He's got his hands up in the air because he's showing he's not going to press that button until he gets the order from the person responsible to give the order to go. And all of these steps, confirmation steps, will have been taking place. I'm not going to describe them. But the man who's going to give him the order to press that button is this guy, the guy I told you at the beginning who I'm going to introduce. The catapult officer, also known as the shooter. This guy, by the way, is the most photographed guy on the ship. Uh, as you can see, even this little boy here is pointing, but everybody poses with the shooter. Some in irreverent positions, some even in erotic positions. Use your imagination, I won't tell you what to do. Now he, right after the launch, is going to shift over to this location because within 30 seconds, he's going to give the go ahead to launch this crusader. Now, when he gives that go ahead, he's also considering the pitching of the aircraft carrier because in the rough sea, if he gives the order in the downswing instead of the upswing, he might create a situation like this. Now, in landing, you see a nice photo here of an F 14 Tomcat. This is the aircraft that was made famous by the movie Top Gun. It's returning to the boat. Naval aviators are the only ones entitled to call a ship a boat because when you look from far above, it looks like a little boat. Everyone else has to call it a ship because you can put a boat on a ship, but you can't put a ship on a boat. The fact that this tail look is down is telling me it's the last pass because the pattern that aircraft take to go into the groove to land, he's in his final approach. He's going to fly about two miles upward come around and decelerate and return back. And from about two or three miles back, he's going to straighten out and start coming in. At this point, he's communicating with the LSO, landing signal officer, in a very dangerous location, LSO platform. If that or any aircraft is coming in and it's going to crash, he has to scramble for his life. So he dives into a trench there lined with cushions. This is not a real person. This is, believe it or not, a medical. He's got a pickle in his hand. Why is it called a pickle? Because it's not a tomato. I tried to find the word origin for a pickle. And there's no explanation why that's called a pickle. That's Navy language. He's ready in case the pilot is imminent to crash if he doesn't correct. He's going to activate that alarm and the lights are going to flash as a wave off. So I'm talking about lights. There are three things on the pilot's mind when he's coming into land. He's looking at, I don't know if you can see it, I'm going to move this test bar. He's thinking of lineup, glide slope, and angle of attack. Not necessarily in that sequence, but that's the main thing on his mind. Lineup is he wants to line up with the midline here. That's the only thing he's looking at the flight deck for. In the glide slope, he's looking at the Fresnel lens. This is a Brit another British innovation. Uh, named after a Frenchman. And what he sees now tells him that he's been on the glide slope and he's in the glide slope now where he's going to touch down and likely catch one of, of the middle cables here. And the other thing is angle of attack. He has to be in the appropriate angle to catch one of those cables. And when I'm talking about the Fresnel lens, at this point, when he was communicating with the LSO, he called the ball, if you remember from the movie Top Gun, because this illumination here, where it is now, is called the meatball. And this is what the Fresnel lens looks like. And real quickly, it's a series of prismatic lenses, but depending on the trajectory that he is in, he will see an illumination. If he sees it here, that's where it is now, that's good. If he sees it high, he might catch one of the forward cables low he might catch one of the aft cables if it's red he better either pick up speed and get into the right trajectory or he's going to crash and at that point the lso will wave them off with his pickle and when we say angle of attack notice that the aircraft will not horizontal the tail is 
likely going to catch this cable here, the middle cable, which is ideal, because after the landing, he will go to the ready room and the LSO will grade him. And that works towards his performance evaluation. By grading him, he might also look at the video taken from the PLAT room, pilot landing aid television. Now, the way this hook is going to catch the cable is because it's elevated off the flight deck by about three to five inches by arc springs, nicknamed fiddle bridges. Use your imagination for that. Maybe speak with weird. So it's likely he's coming in for a good touchdown or a trap, as it's called. He's going to be arrested. And it's a good arrest. Strange name for a reward to be landed. But if he's trapped or arrested, this cable is going to pay out about 300 feet because it's set by hydraulic tension. And the arresting gear operator out of the picture here is going to set the tension on the cable for the weight of the aircraft. It's a different setting for each type of aircraft and a little bit carry. So this is going to be a good touchdown. And the only way he's going to know that he landed is the jolt he's going to feel when he catches that cable. If he doesn't feel that jolt, he better become airborne by the end of the angle deck. And that's why pilots landing on an aircraft carrier flight deck don't use brakes. The opposite is they use full throttle so that they can have enough power to become airborne if they bolter. I mentioned that word before. Missing a cable is called a bolter. And here's the sailor in the PLAT. He is videoing all activity in the flight deck. There are even cameras and video cameras embedded in the flight deck because it's very important that every landing and every launch is recorded. And if I can get the video, oh my gosh, this is a really exciting video. And I'm really sorry you can't see it because what is happening here, you will see an E2 Hawkeye, a radar dome aircraft surveillance plane coming in for a landing. Coming along the middle line here, it will have catched the cable. And the cable at this point would have snapped. And as a result, the Hawkeye will end up off the angle deck, what looks like it's going into the water. The next scene comes up and survives. Five feet off of the water, this pilot had miraculous luck and a crew of five, which normally if it was a jet, they would have been ejected. But in the E-2 Hawkeye, there's no ejection and they would have perished. So that was a lucky day for that pilot. And you would have seen him coming up from here. And I'm sorry, these videos are not really good. Now, that was a fortunate event for the pilot and the crew because they, they were saved. But it's, that was not on the Midway, by the way. But on the Midway in 1985, a similar incident happened that they weren't so fortunate. And it was a night landing at Bolter. Remember, I said that the wire is not cable is not caught, called a Bolter. Here, this is a night landing, which is a lot different physical wise, visibility wise, to a day. It's like day and night. As you can see, the Fresnel lens is illuminated, but this must have been a foggy day because normally it would have been brighter. But this aircraft, the E2 Hawkeye, faltered and uh, came to the end of the angle deck and just fell overboard. And two of the crew were killed and three were rescued. How many aircraft aboard the museum? And can they still fly? It was a bit complicated. The museum has about 30 aircraft, and they're all authentic aircraft except one. And they can't fly anymore. They were restored to junk. They came from various sources. Some of them came from already restored from other institutions, and uh, they are gone. But the Midway is also restored some even before they opened the museum across the bay in the Island Air Station. Volunteers were restoring aircraft. And this is what some of them looked like, believe it or not. This was restored. And uh, the amazing thing about this SDD Nautilus, it was fished out of Lake Michigan. A lot of people don't realize that Lake Michigan had, during World War II, a naval air training station where about 17,000 aviators were training on makeshift aircraft carriers that were like half the length of real aircraft carriers. And uh, about 100 of them are still in Lake Michigan. 40 of them were retrieved. This is one of them. And one of the aviators training it, by the way, was uh, 
young 20 year old ensign who became a war hero because he was shot down in the Pacific. He later went on to become president and had an aircraft carrier named after him, George H.W. Bush. Now, look how this SPV dock has been destroyed. Can you imagine that? Now, I like to talk about the SPD Dauntless because it was a hero during the Battle of Midway, which, as you can figure out, the Midway aircraft there was named after the Battle of Midway. It did not participate in the Battle of Midway because it wasn't commissioned yet. But as I said, aircraft carriers then were named after prestigious battles, so they assigned it to this aircraft carrier being killed at the time. Now, this SP Dauntless was a hero during the Battle of Midway. It was reported to have shot down all four Japanese aircraft carriers, and it also was reported to have destroyed more ships than any other aircraft participating in World War II. And it was such a slow aircraft, but it was a dive bomber that was so accurate that it went in for the kill with little bombs like that. And it was nicknamed, instead of its original scout bomber Douglas, it became small but deadly. Unlike the TBD Devastator, another bomber, destroyer, a torpedo bomber, that all of them were destroyed during the Battle of Midway. None existed anymore. So this aircraft is the only unauthentic aircraft on the Midway. This was made in foam and plastic, believe it or not. And it was made by the producers of the movie, The Last Remake of Midway, starring Woody Harrelson. The Midway got it as a donation from the producer because the Midway help promote the movement. TBM Avenger is there, and this is the aircraft model that George H.W. Bush flew, so it is a celebrity as he was. He was a 20-year-old ensign. Barbara was his fiance at the time, so she owned the place. That's, that's lovely. Now, I was talking about the E-2 Hawkeye before. This is the one that I could have shown you the video of the crashing. This aircraft, was designed specifically for aircraft carriers. Surveillance plane airborne early warning with a radar dome that rotates 24 feet. And the value of this aircraft is such, and it's so important that Midway had four of them in a squadron, and air wings today still have four for air wing. And uh, the value in it is the fact that surface radar is limited to about 25 or 26 miles because of the curvature of the Earth. Now you send one of these surveillance radar domes up about a mile high and you increase the range more than tenfold. So with this type of surveillance, you really have good protection. You don't need short range protection. You need long range protection on an aircraft carrier. This is an interesting aircraft carrier. It's the largest aircraft carrier that ever flew off of the Midway, nicknamed the Whale. It has a wingspan the size of a tennis court. Its first uh, duty was to serve as a strategic bomber capable of holding large nuclear bombs. It didn't serve that purpose for long because it became a tanker. If you look at this little protrusion from the rear, this is a basket called a drone. Drove. The telescopes rear to about 100 feet, 75 to 100 feet for the recipient jet that is being refueled to insert a probe into it and get refueled in a matter of just a couple minutes because it's transferring fuel at a rate of 300 gallons per minute. Try to fill up your gas tank with that. So here is a nice photo of the Sky Warrior engaged in a quickie three, two minute intercourse with the Crusader. And that takes some good skills of the Navy pilot. There are two types of refueling methods. The Navy uses the probe and drogue method, which I just explained, where the aviator, who is really flying skillfully beneath and under the tanker, is inserting his probe into the basket and he's getting refueled in a matter of two minutes and he's on his way. The flying boom method, which the Air Force uses, doesn't require such skill on the part of the recipient aviator, but the boom operator is being extended a rigid boom from a tanker above. This airman is laying on his belly with a joystick, directing this boom to fill a receptacle much, not much larger than a teacup. And in a matter of one third the time, because it's 
transferring 900 gallons per minute, the Air Force is a much faster method. But it's more flexible method for Navy with the probe and drogue method. So the Navy claims that as far as refueling goes, they are superior as far as aviating a pilot's aviation. But they will concede that the Air Force is superior in passing gas. So that's the Navy versus the Air Force. And that was then, for the future, Boeing has a multi-billion dollar contract with the Navy to provide 70 of these UAVs, commonly called drones, to refuel mid-air. They are capable of carrying about 10,000 to 15,000 pounds, because that's how you measure fuel. And they will be remotely transferring fuel to recipients. So the future is now, and so is the end of my program. Do we have time for questions, Lou? Sure. You know, we, we we only ran over by a few minutes. So yes, we will take a few more minutes to do some questions. Well, uh, I, I say again, take a look at my email address because I really welcome comments, questions, and I will be glad to accommodate anybody. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I know we had emailed you a question earlier today that may have already been addressed from uh, Cy Coleman, and I don't know if he's still on, but he had asked a question, maybe you two have already engaged via email. And then another one was about visiting, um, especially right now uh, with the limited access, but that you can visit the bow of the Midway um, to get a kind of a taste of the venue and come back for more. So um, can you tell us a little more, more about how we can support the Midway now in 2021 and what visiting kind of looks like? Well, you can support the Midway in many ways. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question because one of the slides I showed was by volunteering. I mean, so we have 800 volunteers. There's always a need for more. There are many ways to volunteer on the Midway. Uh, like I said, I volunteer as a docent. I volunteer in other capacities as well. But volunteers is always a way. Donations, of course, uh, they'll take your money and they'll put it in their charitable foundation. Uh, and also visiting. And the thing I like to say about the Midway and San Diego is that demographics show that uh, less than 15% of our visitors are San Diegans. And when they come aboard, it's because out of towners are visiting them. So whenever I'm talking to an out of town, I say, next time you visit San Diego, bring a, bring a San Diego aboard the Midway. I hope I answered the question. Wonderful. Well, I will also open it if there's anyone that wants to ask a question here. We, we do have a couple of thank yous here in the chat, which is lovely. But if anyone has a burning question, please feel free. We've got about three more minutes here. and We'd love to answer any questions. Fred, your, your talk was very thorough. Well, I, and that's why I compiled a bunch of FAQs, because I find people sometimes have questions in mind, but they just can't think of asking them at the time. So uh, Hopefully, if you come up with questions, once again, you have my email address and I will be glad to communicate with you. Well, we can't thank you enough. This has been lovely. On behalf of the Daytimers Committee and the Temple, we love being able to kind of share some San Diego things with our community. And we look forward to working with you again. And hopefully, if we get to come and tour the Midway or bring one of our youth groups or adult groups, we'd love to come see it with you. One more thing, if I might add, and along the question I just answered. Another way that uh, people, especially San Diegans, can contribute is by membership. Got a large number of members. And if you visit the Midway, the uh, initial admission costs will go towards a membership. And it's not that much more. So uh, we do encourage members that can uh, come aboard anytime. Well, on behalf of uh, Lynn and Sima and the Daytimers Committee, we're very thankful. And we are going to be closing out the Zoom room. Thank you all so much for joining us, Fred. Thank you for taking the time. This was fantastic. By the way, is this recorded now that we can see it on, on the cloud? How do we access yeah. it? Yeah, so what I did was um, we streamed it to YouTube. So I will send you a link immediately after this and you can feel free to share it with anyone you'd like. It's a free and open to the public link. Very good. Thank you, Eileen, appreciate it once again. And also you might know that the Midway Speakers Bureau, this is only one of about a half a dozen topics. If you have any uh, need for any more information, uh, we can provide you with a speaker and a topic. Awesome, that would be great. Thanks so much. And uh, okay. we look forward to learning with you again. I'm gonna sign off. I say bye-bye to everybody. Thank you all for being 
in the Zoom room. And I hope to see and talk with you.